So let's put that in perspective with everything else we've been talking about, right? So in the, the big picture view, we talked about dynamic programming approaches to solve for the cost to go. We had a few of them. We had the, um, you know, the version on a mesh where we could say beautiful things about it converging, but it would run out of steam in terms of the discretization growing very quickly and large in high dimensions. Right? We had a neural value iteration that has less guarantees, scales better, can handle a lot of interesting um, you know, shapes of my J. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, um, <clears throat> but I, the only real drawback is that it has less guarantees in terms of we don't know when it will converge or, um, or when it will fail. We've talked about LQR, you know, this is scales to arbitrarily large dimensions, but it's restricted to linear systems, right? Okay, we've talked about sums of squares and Lyapunov type methods. I didn't get to show you my hard earned cart pull swing up. It's, you've seen cart pull swing ups, you'll see different cart pull swing ups today, but if you want, you can run the sums of squares approximate dynamic programming and see that a convex optimization can find a cost to go that swings up the cart pull. That's a, that was big news for me, okay. Those methods <clears throat> um, can be made to have guarantees, okay, um, because we can check the Apunov conditions. The, the sums of squares pushing up from below for the approximate cost to go doesn't have a, that's the convex one. That doesn't give performance guarantees. You have to bring a different version down from above in order to have performance guarantees, okay, but those, that set of tools are, are designed to be in a regime where we can be giving guarantees. And they scale fairly well, you know, to, to definitely more than we can do with meshes, but, you know, not, when you start getting to tens of degrees of freedom, um, it starts to, starts to run out of steam. So far, I think theory uh, has more to say than the practitioners have made use of yet. Okay, but somehow we've mostly Apart from LQR, which is for linear systems, we've mostly had methods that are very clean, but they're restricted to relatively low dimensional systems. So the story for trajectory optimization, the context for trajectory optimization, is that we want to somehow fundamentally break this curse of dimensionality, okay? Um, and the, the reason that all these methods are difficult in high dimensions is because you're trying to solve a very high dimensional problem, right? So a, a very large, a function for all x, right? This is a hard thing to do as the dimension of x increases. Trajectory optimization fundamentally gets around that, okay? The way it does that is instead of thinking about for all x, it thinks about a single initial condition and tries to roll out just one solution from a particular initial condition. This is now almost immune to the dimension of, of the state and now the, the complexity goes with time, okay? So we're gonna just analyze single trajectories. That sounds very good and very powerful, but it'll, we'll have other problems that come along with it. I mean, if you never look um, at all of the states, then it's hard to say something about global optimality, for instance, that's basically what you give up. You can say something locally, you say any local change to my trajectory gets worse, that works, that makes sense, that scales. But asking for something to be global requires looking at all of the states, okay? So that stays hard. Now, it's, it's, I think it's an interesting sort of uh, distinction. I kind of made this comment early when someone was asking about it um, or in one of the early DP lectures, right? But if you count the number of degrees of freedom on a humanoid or on my, my humanoid, right? I have many, many degrees of freedom, right? Um, 
I only have a certain number of years to live in this world, right? It would take more than that to visit all of the possible states in my state space. If I were to examine you know, all of the possible configurations that my body is capable or used to be capable of getting into, yeah? Uh, so it sort of makes sense that we shouldn't have to solve all of that, right? It might be too much to ask that we have to solve for all possible x. So dialing it in seems to make sense. This is gonna, the, the trajectory optimization view of the world is kind of taking that to an extreme where we're taking it to one state, initial state. Okay, probably the right answer is something in between the two. But it's good, to, let's, let's start working again back from the trajectory optimization case. So the basic trajectory optimization formulation is still gonna look a lot like our dynamic programming, you know, optimal control formulation. Uh, we're still gonna have uh, a dynamical system. In general, we'll say we've got our dynamical system, x dot equals f of x u, and I'm gonna write optimization problems that still try to optimize some long-term objective, okay? subject to the dynamic constraints, okay, maybe some other additional constraints, collision avoidance, joint um, input limits, but most importantly, what we're going to do that breaks this curse is we're going to say x at time zero is a particular state, okay. And instead of saying my decision variables are somehow like a cost to go everywhere, I'm gonna restrict my search to just the trajectories, which I'm, in this notation, I'm saying x is a continuous trajectory, u is a continuous trajectory. I wanna find over this, over some class of continuous curves, something that satisfies all these equations. Right, this one has to hold for all time, okay? That's the basic formulation. All of the work is gonna be figuring out the right way to cast that general idea into the optimization tools that we, we know and can you know, have performance solvers for and have you know, good numerical recipes. All of that is easier in discrete time. So even though I wanna think about this as a continuous time optimization, the transcription, you know, in some sense, the problem is more beautiful in continuous time, and we'll see we'll see examples for why. But the transcription is easier to think about in discrete time. So let me think. Let's start with discrete time. Right, almost exactly that, but now in, in discrete time, okay? So the simplest um, case of that, let me even do it for um, linear discrete time systems. Always makes sense to pay, it makes, it makes sense to think about the linear time first, just to, if your solutions don't work for that, then there's a problem, okay? So, <clears throat> Um, in this case, let me write it like this. Now I've got a finite set of decision variables which represent x and u at particular times, okay? I'm gonna, my, my integral becomes a sum, and I'll do it over some finite uh, horizon of L, x, n, u, n,
Okay, let's just take a minute to think about that problem, okay? So now our decision variables, we have, what are the decision variables here, right? We now have x, you could sort of say x0 isn't, it doesn't need to be a decision variable since it's fixed, so I'll just say x1 to xn. These are just vectors. There's a lot of them. There's up, up the horizon of them. There's u from time 0. I actually only need it for n minus 1, depending on what my final cost is. Okay. These, the nice thing about having linear dynamics is that the, the dynamics come in as linear constraints in the optimization problem, right? This is certainly initial constraint. Things like input limits are all linear convex constraints. Okay, so if I'm willing to choose some convex cost function, like a, a, something that's linear is a cost function or a quadratic in the cost function, then I'm in the state where even though I'm doing trajectory optimization now, I, can, I still have a convex optimization problem, okay? So I choose convex costs like something like that, okay? Then, then if I have a quadratic cost and linear constraints, then I'm in the realm of quadratic programming, right? This would be a quadratic program. Okay, and honestly, I mean, even when you get to really complicated things, I, this rarely feels like a, a huge limitation to me. Uh, you know, I think the, the adding the rich enough dynamics and constraints become limiting. But this is a pretty good cost function for a lot of tasks. Yeah. Hey, could you clarify how we're able to define uh, the x inputs as a decision variable when it's subject to like the dynamic constraints? Okay, so I think you're you're actually probably even thinking ahead to the next transcription because it's true that you can you can actually solve away x if you know x zero and you know the u's. You could solve for x. Just kind of run the simulation forward, all right? And that'll be a different transcription that also has some pros and cons compared to this one. But certainly it's, it, you know, if you just think about this from the language of, of optimization, I certainly can make additional decision variables. They sound, they seem extra to your thinking, I, I, I think, but I, and, but I can define them with linear constraints. Is that fair? Yeah? It is true that you could solve those away, and we will, yeah. Okay, so um, there's a couple ways to do that, it's, and it's a, it's a decision you have, uh, have to make, right? So if you want to, say, find me over the class of curves something that absolutely gets to the final condition, you could put in a constraint like, I want to be at this final condition absolutely. Sometimes that's, it, it's hard to achieve that. Even in, even in the double integrator, it can be hard to achieve that because if your timing isn't perfect, you might not be able to get there exactly at the right time. So sometimes we'll put in softer constraints. You could just put um, a final cost. For instance, you could say that um, L for, you know, if, if I say the nth L, if I, maybe I could just even add a particular one just to emphasize it here. If I could say this is, this is the ones I use for my running cost, and I just say at the nth time, I'll add an extra big one that penalizes me from being away at xn. I just have like a really steep quadratic form. Yeah. Cool. Yes. And if Q's and R's are different. That's true. You could um, you could certainly have Q and R be different at different parts of, at different points of time. Yeah. There's no limitation for that. There's actually there's a handful of other quad uh, of of convex costs you can pick, right? So um, you could this is a uh, quadratic, you could do 
um, absolute values here. You could do maxes here. These are the standard L one norm, L infinity norms. They all will give you convex optimizations. There's different choices of convex functions that can be useful to choose here. Um, I tried to mention a few of them in the notes. For instance, if we wanted to do the minimum time problem, okay, like I said, I always like to compare our numerical solutions to the, sub, the handful of solutions that we actually understand. Right? Remember, we understand the bang bang optimal control solution. Can we get that out of this recipe? I think that's useful to think about. Certainly, the double integrator is a linear dynamics. What's the minimum time cost look like? Is that a convex cost in this, in this world? It's kind of a trick question. In the way I've written it, N, capital N is fixed. That's not a decision variable, okay? For this optimization problem is solving for any fixed horizon. The horizon is absolutely fixed, okay? So you can solve even a feasibility problem. If I were to just say LX U is zero, I just don't care about the cost, and just say, can you find a solution in n steps to get to the goal, that is a convex optimization problem. Okay, since it's a since it's convex optimization problems have reliable numerical recipes, they're guaranteed to say, here's the optimal solution, or no optimal solution exists. So if you want to solve the minimum time problem, you can actually solve many convex optimization problems. Just keep increasing n until the first one that succeeds. That's your minimum time. You can actually do a golden section, you know, bracket, uh, line, a clever line search to do, to do that too. Okay, so let's just do that real quick to make sure we understand. Because there's some nuances of the, um, the discrete formulation. I will come back to that in a second. Okay, so we'll optimize the double integrator with a fixed horizon n. People said in the survey that they thought it was okay. It was useful to step through some of the the code to make sure it matches, okay? So my A and B matrices for the discrete time dynamics are just the familiar ones for the, um, for the double integrator, but then I've made a discrete time approximation, right? So I just said that the way I made a discrete time approximation is I said xn plus one equals xn plus dt times my original AX and plus BU. You can do more clever things for linear integration, but this is the Euler integration. Okay. So then I'm gonna make a mathematical program. I'm gonna make a lot of decision variables, right? I'm gonna, it just happens that there's only one control input in a double integrator, right? And there's two states. So I'm gonna make one n minus one for u, two to n for x. I go ahead and add the constraint that x zero has to equal my, my coming, in, incoming one. I could, have not, I could have not made that decision variable. That would have been fine. And then I'm just gonna loop through and add those dynamic constraints, saying x n plus one equals a dot, you know, a plus b u. I'm putting the input limit negative one to one, add the quadratic cost, uh, sorry, I, I actually added a quadratic cost just to make the numerics better, okay? I'll, I'll show you with or without that. But like, like I said, I, I never let the solver have, I rarely just say a feasibility problem. It's always better to say, of all the little things you could pick in the noise, pick this one. I'll show you the difference between those two, okay? And then I'm gonna put the final condition constraint. So in this case, I am doing exactly putting a final condition constraint, and we'll solve. All right, so. There we go. So I put it in the initial condition negative two, zero, and you remember the solution, right? So the bang bang solutions in Q and Q dot were that you would take maximum velocity or maximum acceleration till, till you hit the switching surface, and then you'd ride that directly back in, okay? And that's exactly what, it, well, almost exactly what it found. Okay, so this is, this is Q versus Q dot of the solution. 
All right, and then this is the U trajectory. Bang, bang, almost. There's a little slant there, right? So I would expect the true optimal solution to be the optimal U as a function of time should really be, I've got a U max, and then I've got, I immediately change to U min, right? And what I'm seeing there is a little bit, it's pretty close to it, but there's a little bit of a slant to that solution. I can make it, if I take that, uh, if I take that um, objective away, my little work away with the noise, you'll see it even more glaring. Okay, where'd I put my objective here? Let's just take that out. Okay, look at that. So, do you see what happens here? It's a, let's just think about exactly what's happening, all right? But, but you can see the artifact here is that it's picking U, U negative U, U, negative U max like this. And there's even a little blip there. Okay, so why is it doing that? People have a guess for why it's doing that? What's that? It's a feasible solution, why not? It's a feasible solution, why not? But I, I want optimal solutions, right? Yes, it's, it's true, but so why can't I get a more, this is the best I can get without, if I have no costs? Yes, right, so, so there is no DT or there's no multiple of the DT I picked that gets me exactly to the goal with the bang bang controller, right? So what I when you what these discrete time approximations is doing, right? Is you have to think about that as it's adding an additional constraint on what my sol my solution can possibly do, right? I have time and I have u of n. The parameterization I've given the controller is like it's only able to pick a, a, a discrete number of u's, right? So this is like u0, u1, u2, right? And at each time, I'm evaluating the dynamics as if that U is fixed, and I'm multiplying it forward to here. So that's like putting a zero order hold, you might call that. There's various ways that people talk about going from continuous to discrete, right? And zero order hold is what a signal processing person might call that phenomenon of actually holding that. A first order hold would be a linear interpolation, right? Okay, and you should think about that as putting, uh, it's, it's a limitation of the way we've parameterized the solution, but you can think of it as an artificial constraint on the optimization, right? <clears throat> now the real solution, just if it happened to line up exactly at one of the DTs, I would get the perfect solution out. But the optimal solution, I actually, um, let's just look back at it here. Uh, Come on. Okay, there it is. This is the, the original derivation we did, right? This is the bang bang solution. These are the curves. This is the optimal cost to go. Okay, and it has a closed form solution, which in this regime was the cost to go is this. I picked Q equals negative two, Q dot equals zero, so it works out to just be that the, the true minimum time is two square root of two, which is what, 2.83 or something like that. But if it was exactly 2.83, I'd get it, but it's actually 2.829 or something. 
something like that, okay? And so I'm getting close to that, but somewhere here it has to make a choice, okay? It has to use, it has a, it has a freedom to somehow use less than the max or less than the min in order to achieve that goal and get exactly to the goal, okay? When I don't put an objective on it, then I get this, uh, the solver gets to pick whatever it wants, and it picked that, right? I'm going to get a little less u for one time step, a little more u, a little more, and then, and then one of these to just, you know, make it all work. But there's a whole manifold of possible ways that it could be less than bang, bang in order to come. It takes one more time step than I wished it did, and it uses a less than a maximum u to get there. If I put that back in, then all I've done is say, among the different solutions, pick the ones where u is close to zero. And that's enough to say, okay, the one I'm going to take is this, the beautiful one that's close, right? So that's exactly what I mean when I say, don't leave, don't let the solver pick for you. You should just say, even if you tried to write an optimal, you know, a, a feasibility problem, go ahead and say, if there's multiple solutions, I want this one. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. If we said, that's a good question. So if I said add bounding box um, x minus, let's say, I gotta get my numpy syntax correct here, but um, minus 0 0.01, 0 0.01, let's say, and plus that. Oh, this is my initial condition. I wanna do it to the final condition. Something like that. Let's see. Um, but let's take away the, you want that, right? I gave it even more freedom, I guess. So that's just giving my, it's like laying out the, the rope to hang me from, right? But that's a good question, yeah. That, the, things like that can work. I think an objective on the, on the end, a, a cost on the end, would probably do maybe more what you're thinking, yeah. Cool. Okay, so of course, th so these recipes um, work for, you can, you can write a similar version of the problem. We'll think about what happens with it, even if you have nonlinear dynamics here. And this setup is just such a popular, com you know, common setup. Then we have codes that'll set up all those for you, add the decision variables for you. And then you can it's, you have, we have a rich library of constraints. You can say, I want to avoid collisions. I want to do this. I want to do this. Okay, so we can do exactly the same thing in like many less lines. If I just say, instead of using mathematical program directly, we use the direct transcription class. It looks almost the same. I just say direct transcription, and it's even easier to add those constraints, okay? And you can get the same solutions out. And we'll see that goes a long way. It works for hard, complicated problems. Now it's interesting here. So I picked n equals 284, right? Which sounds, but I actually did a line search first to find that. And then I realized, oh, I should know the answer. I should have known that answer. I, and then I realized it's actually, it should be 283, but n minus one. So it actually works out. It's exactly rounded up by one from what the analytical solution was. But I was, more foolish. I did the, the manual line search first and then, yeah. Can you give me an example of like real physicists and thinking out of you know, the optimal axis of physics? Yes. Are there any other physics where you could use like your own knowledge of those artifacts and those physics to know that like the axis will look different in a certain kind of setting? That's a good question. Yeah, so, so let me try to say it back, see if I capture the essence of it, right? So there's gonna be more complicated problems where we don't know the analytical solution, but maybe we can still analyze the discrete to continuous artifacts. Is that right? Um, so I think that is exactly right. Um, and I think th this, that's what I'm trying to convey in this picture. You can always think, even in more complicated settings, of the true solution being potentially a continuous curve in U, and the discretization is like an artificial constraint. For instance, the cost will always be higher because it's not free to take those arbitrary things. There's, it's like you've added a constraint saying you must be flat every consecutive DT, okay? So always the cost will be higher than you, than you want and the solutions 
there's different interpolation schemes. You could do first order or whatever, but each of them feels like a constraint that you didn't want, but are stuck with because of the discretization. Good question. Okay, if you understand that, let's, let's just think about what, what did we, so this is a, you know, this is certainly, as I've written it here, that is a lot like LQR, right? But it's doing something that LQR couldn't do. What's it doing that LQR couldn't do? Right? I could put input limits. I could put state constraints. LQR, it's hard to solve for input limits and state constraints for all x. Okay? But if you pick for just one initial condition, then it's, that's still a convex problem. And in fact, if you ask you know, a control theorist, like, okay, what is the generalization of LQR to constrained LQR, they would write down this problem. This is the, the known sort of right solution to doing, to doing constrained LQR, okay? And it scales very well too, because, it's, because quadratic programming solvers are awesome. Right? I think I'm occasionally electric because of my zipper. Sorry for the static. Okay, so if you understand that, you understand the, the essence of trajectory optimization. Okay, but all the rest of the work, like I said, is about thinking about different ways to transcribe the basic dynamic constraints into solvers, okay? They have different numerical properties. They can be interpreted, the, the interpolation schemes are different. Some of them have higher order accuracy for nonlinear systems, you know, that's, and, and some of them the solvers just perform better with, okay? So you can go a lot farther if you understand those extra transcriptions, but this is the, really the heart of it. keep using this word transcription, okay, that it's the common name used in trajectory optimization. It's a perfectly good word. You want to transcribe your idea of what the trajectory optimization problem is into a particular thing that the solver understands. So you have to make some decision about the, the number, of the decision variables, the, the way you're going to write your constraints, right? So that's the transcription. This one above is called the direct transcription. but it's not the only transcription, yeah? For instance, you could solve away the extra x's. The direct transcription is the one that has these, these decision variables, okay? And you have both state and input as decision variables, and you have the constraints written as, as con direct constraints on them. Alternative would be direct shooting. Transcriptions, okay. Why direct? There's a, there's a whole other line of, of solution techniques based on Pontryagin's minimum principle, which we might get to, depending on how far it goes in the, in the trajectory optimization lectures, okay. But there, there are indirect methods. It's not just that I choose to prefix everything with direct for, for show. Um, <coughs> Okay, in the, in the direct shooting methods, let's go ahead and solve away the x variables, right? So if I have a linear system, it's particularly easy, but this can be done in even for nonlinear systems, okay? So um, if I have the dynamics then knowing just x0 and then all of my u's, should really be enough. Like the problem is completely defined if I know my initial conditions and the u's, right? And in linear systems, you can see exactly the effect of that. I can just m multiply out. I get you know, an a to the n 
x0 plus this famous but sort of nasty, um, it goes to n minus 1, a of n minus k minus 1, b u k. That's just me multiplying through. I'm going to solve for x1. I'm going to put x1 in, solve for x2, put x2 in, solve for x3. Each one of them gets picks up one more u. That's why you get this sum from k to n minus 1. Okay, That's just the, the standard rollout to solve for xn as a function of x0 and u's. And I could take this and insert this solution if I'm going to min now just over u's of the sum of n equals 0 to n, xn transpose qxn, for instance. Everywhere I had an xn, I could just insert this solution indirectly to just get a bigger but still quadratic constraint that are only depends on x0 and u. Okay. And then I don't even need x as a decision variable. I don't need those, that list of dynamic constraints. I've solved the dynamics away, and I have what sounds, what looks like a smaller optimization problem. It has less decision variables. Okay, and it should solve the same problem, and it does. Absolutely. So these are the, the shooting methods. I didn't actually type this one in, but these work too. Okay. So let's just compare the two. You know. Shooting has less decision variables, right? That's good. Seems like an obvious winner. But there are a few things that are slightly less good about this in practice. Um, the numerics actually can be worse. It depends on your system, your A and B matrices, but putting in, your, in the middle of your optimization problem something like A to the N can be, if N gets big and A is you know, squarely, if it's on the boundary of stability or something like that, then that can be a bad thing to try to hand to your solver. You're, you're handing very big numbers and very small numbers to your solver here. Okay? And that's true for nonlinear systems too. People talk about um, there's different names for it. Some people call it the tail wagging the dog. I don't like that particular expression, but you might hear it, okay? But uh, you might hear vanishing gradients in uh, long neural network training kind of things, okay? If you try to roll out your dynamics too far, it is true that your gradients can, you know, the effect of your initial conditions has a very big effect on the final conditions. That's a real thing, but it can cause numerical issues if you're gonna write the dynamics like this. Okay, in some sense, by adding extra decision variables, that formulation avoids the vanishing gradient problem because it, each of the individual constraints is nice, but it uses more decision variables to get around that. Okay, the other, I mean, there's a few other things. So <clears throat> this is totally, this is reasonable if I'm gonna insert this you know, into my objective. But if I have like a lot of constraints that all use x at time you know, 13 or whatever, I have to s substitute that into every single one of those constraints. So it can be, it definitely is nicer to write constraints, state constraints in that version. Okay, and um, not beyond the numerics, this, this problem formulation is dense. Like each of your, your objective depends on all of the parameters. Your constraints tend to depend on all of the parameters. This formulation is sparse. You can have lots of small con, um, objectives that all depend on just a subset of the variables, and your constraints depend on a subset of the variables. 
And so some sol if you just trust your solvers and say the solvers should do the best thing and exploit sparsity, then good solvers can take a lot of advantage of that formulation. So it's actually not obviously worse to have more decision variables because they can exploit that sparsity if you trust your solver. Yeah? Okay, so what did we gain? So compared to LQR, we now have like the ability to do uh, control, you know, different con costs and constraints. If we pick convex costs and constraints, it's still a convex optimization, all right? Compared to value iteration, like on a mesh, for instance, we suffered even, remember the double integrator solution wasn't quite right. It wasn't getting one because of the discretization errors in state, okay? The discretization is still happening here, but it's happening only along one dimension, which is time. And we know a lot more about numerical recipes, numerical, you know, um, for, for sort of bounding the integration accuracy of a, of a numerical integrator. Okay, so everything you know or don't know about, uh, about like error controlled integration, numerical recipes for like numerical integration, they can all be folded in here. If you know how to write a Hermit Simpson, you know, integral in there, you can put, you can pop that right in and get the added accuracy that you would, that would be afforded. There is well understood, you know, numerical recipes for understanding errors on meshes, but it gets harder in, as the dimension goes up. You know, for 2D and 3D, where people in like computational fluid dynamics have worked a lot, they've done like really a lot of analysis, but like ND, is actually less explored and less mature than the 2D and 3D cases. Yes? Uh, what's the connection with model predictive control? Is it interconnected at all? It, it is perfectly connected. In fact, the next three words on my paper are model predictive control. <laughs> nice call. So, in fact, yeah, so if you were to ask your control theory friend, what, you know, what is the solution for constrained LQR? They would probably not write the math down. They would just say model predictive control. In the particular case of linear model predictive control, they would mean that optimization, okay? But the idea of model predictive control, let me go over here, because I'll leave that up for a second. call it MPC, right? Model predictive control. The idea is <clears throat> this doesn't give me a feedback controller out of the box. If I just solve this once, it only tells me how to, how to go along from one initial condition, okay? But if I start executing this trajectory and there's a disturbance that knocks me off the trajectory, then that initial solution doesn't tell me what to do. Okay, so LQR was better in that sense. It gave me a whole policy. This is just a, a trajectory. MPC is just simply the idea is if you can solve this optimization reliably and fast enough, just solve it on every time step. Wherever you find yourself, go ahead and solve this optimization problem, and that gives you a feedback controller, right? Now, we're, we'll, get, we'll get back to it when we cover proper feedback stabilization. There's a lot of interesting things to understand about model predictive control. You should think of that as a, as a, a similar but slightly different optimization problem on every time step, right? So you've got a, some noise came in. Maybe you're thinking about n steps in the future. You're going to think about the n plus one step next time when you did, didn't think about it the first time. Okay, there's all kinds of interesting things you can do to guarantee that if you had a solution on one time, you're guaranteed to get a solution the next time. We'll talk about that soon. But at the high level, if you have this and you want a policy, if you can trust your trajectory optimization, it can give you a policy. There's also interesting work called explicit model predictive control that tries to understand what the solution would be for all states. Try to turn that into a policy that you pre-compute so you don't have to solve trajectory optimization online. And 
that field of explicit model predictive control is hugely valuable, but, but more for the theory it gave us than the practice. Because basically what it tells you is that the optimal control, so optimal policy, the cost to go, gets really complicated really fast. It's like, you know, remember we had, for LQR, we had a beautiful quadratic bowl. For constrained LQR, even, you have a piecewise quadratic, but the number of pieces is like doubly exponential in the, you know, or something like this, okay? So it, it grows really, really fast, and it's hard to compute. But yes, so, so oftentimes this, the name for this is actually MPC just because it's strong connection to the thing that people do online. Yeah? So how is, or I guess like if you have a difference between uh, explicit MPC and that first value or anything, uh, Craig was already talked about that your action space is continuous. Explicit MPC has really good solutions. Like, well, if you could compute the, all of the pieces, we could exactly compute them. In the cases of linear dynamics, continuous actions, yep. It's like, yeah, it's like saying there's a special case of value iteration where I can solve, because I know it's the solution, every point is a solution to a quadratic program, I can map that space out. Instead of by, by iterating, I can just directly solve for that space. Yes? That, that ends up being for one initial trajectory, though, right? Explicit MPC is trying to solve for all initial conditions. The optimal trajectory from all initial conditions. Uh, for whatever cost function, right? For whatever cost function. If you had a quadratic uh, cost at the end instead of a final cost, a final constraint, then the solutions may not drive you exactly there. Okay. So those are two of the methods, and both of them actually transition pretty directly if I were to make, um, if I were to change from linear dynamics to nonlinear dynamics. The main thing that you lose is that it's a convex optimization problem. It becomes a non-convex optimization problem and your mileage may vary, okay? In practice, we'll talk about the local minima and everything that comes up. So one thing that it would, be, would have been super nice, even in the, the double integrator problem, wouldn't it have been nice, for instance, to like say delta t, whatever my time step, wouldn't it have been nice if that had been a decision variable? Okay, so if I had in my dynamics, if I have erased it at this point, but if I said xn plus one is xn plus, I'll call it h for my time step, okay? If I make h a decision variable also, okay, then my, what used to be a dynamic constraint, uh, a linear constraint becomes a bilinear constraint, right? Now it becomes bilinear. And in general, that's not a convex function. But if I'm willing to, to solve a, a slightly harder optimization, a nonlinear optimization, then I can potentially do that. And just to finish the double integrator sort of recipe here, this is um, uh, another continue, a, a similar transcription, but this time, time, the delta t is a decision variable, and I can put a cost explicitly on final time, okay? It's otherwise almost the same, okay? But this time, it solves something that looks good. It does actually still have a zero here, but it comes out with the minimum time, which is like very close to, to what we expect, we wanted it to be. Okay, it's, it, and it didn't, I did not involve a line search. I didn't, I didn't have to do any, I could just solve one optimization. It would sh stretch or shrink the, um, the trajectory until it satisfied that final constraint. Yeah. Why does it still have that zero value? It's totally complex. I don't know. Why couldn't it have gone st straight down? I don't know. We should look. We should, I mean, because, so here's what I would do to look. I would um, 
solve the same, I would evaluate the, optimal, the same optimization problem with the solution that you wanted, okay, and see if its cost is lower, then, and it still satisfied all my constraints, then I would say it's about a little local minima, but that seems too clean to be a local minima. I think there's probably something in my formulation that implicitly asked it to do that. Good call. Okay, let's see. Well, I did end 41 in this one. But let's see if that matters. Oh, look at that. Nice. 42. I'm so used to picking odd numbers because I want, I typically want something to go through zero. Good call. He says, he says it was an even odd. So sorry, what exactly, why did that matter, the even or oddness? Ah, I see. Okay. I understand. Perfect. You're saying that I, I couldn't, I, before I was enforcing that, uh, that you min had more steps there than you max, so it, it was breaking the tie by putting it in the middle. Bonus. That's, uh, that's great. Good question. Good solution. Okay. So in this case, the nonlinear optimization just worked. All right. Um, but in the more general case of, you know, in, in this, in this nonlinear optimization, we're into a, a richer class of, uh, of optimization problems and we're going to have less guarantees. Okay. So in general, once we get into the nonlinear optimization, <clears throat> we have different class of solvers. By the way, <clears throat> when you're, when you're using mathematical program in Drake, if you, just like in other um, solvers like Jump and Julia or CVX or something, if you add constraints and they all happen to be linear and a cost that happens to be quadratic, then it solves, a, it calls a QP solver. As soon as you add one constraint that's nonlinear, it will actually call a different solver to get that. Um, it tends to call snopped if you're using the binaries, yeah. Um, yeah, so we tend to call snopped as a different solver. Snopped is a SQP method. So. The solver you will tend to see is snopped, which is a sequential quadratic programming. That, this board is almost unusable, huh? Should I just skip that? It's so dark. Let me try this one. Okay, so if I have some potentially nonlinear objective or nonlinear constraints, if I have x, f of x, and I'm trying to minimize f of x, and I have some initial guess, let's say x star you know, at time zero is something like this, you could do gradient descent. We've sort of talked about doing gradient descent before where I could just start walking downhill <clears throat> until I get to the optimum. What snopped, what a sequential quadratic programming solver is going to do is at, you, at your current point, it's going to take the gradient, possibly the second derivative, okay? And it's going to make a local quadratic approximation of the function. And it'll use the second order update to go directly to the minimum. And then it'll take a new quadratic approximation, jump to the minimum. Okay, this one, the way I've drawn it was bad, but you can imagine sometimes it hops down to good global solutions, sometimes it gets stuck. That's just the name, nature of the game when you're playing nonlinear optimization. The nice thing about sequential quadratic programming compared to gradient descent, there are ways to handle constraints in gradient descent, but they, they're handled directly in sequ sequential quadratic programming. At each step, it takes a quadratic approximation of the cost and a linear approximation of the constraints, and it can solve the constrained optimization, and then repeat, okay? 
So even if my constraints, which have dynamics in them, that's where I added a nonlinear constraint with this, it's just going to linearize that on each step, solve the quadratic programming pro program, and then relinearize, wash, rinse, and repeat. And that works fantastically well in some problems, and sometimes it gets stuck in, in local minima. Okay, so is the, is the local minima, let me give you a classic example of local minima and trajectory optimization, okay? So imagine I have like an airplane, this is a, gonna offend any aerodynamicists in the, in the room, okay, but I've got an airplane that's going to fly, take some trajectories, okay? And there's some obstacles. We like to make polygonal obstacles, even though I don't know, trees aren't really polygonal, but um, buildings are, I guess. So there you go. I'll make some polygonal obstacles. Okay, and I have to, if I'm going to have my plane dart through the city, um, I could use trajectory optimization for that, okay? But this is also one of the classic examples of a local minima, right? So um, let's say I'm trying to get over here. If I am currently, if my solver is currently considering trajectories that look like this, and the optimal solution is to go this way, right? Then it's very hard. For, it looks a lot like this in some sense, right? It looks like one of these local minima because the, from the solver's perspective, it's going to have to violate some constraints or its objective is going to have to get worse in order for it to get better. So it looks a lot like one of these situations where there might be a better solution to be found, but I'm in a pretty good one right now, and locally I can't improve it. Okay. And all of these methods that once you do nonlinear optimization are looking at the local conditions saying, would a small change in this improve? Snopped will tell you it's happy if it finds one of these local minima. It doesn't know better. So that's what you give up when you, um, when you switch to nonlinear optimization. You guys look like you've been working hard. So I, I, I have a decision uh, point. I could either keep going with these things or I'm going to, let me do the slightly more fun version of the second part, okay? Just to wake everybody up. Um, you can stretch if you want real quick, and then we'll, we'll do something fun. Can we talk through, like, trajectory optimization where we want to, like, manipulate something that goes through contact? We're going we're gonna to have lectures on, on – uh, we're going to go through the same kind of things with, with contact soon. Yep, for sure. Okay. Here's just to see where this could go. Like people really use, um, I should even do it like this. Okay, so people really use trajectory optimization in practice. This is like a ridiculously old sort of patent, but all the autonomous driving companies, if you've worked at it there over the summer, you might have heard about their MPC controller or their, uh, their trajectory optimization that's deciding locally how to make decisions around to avoid cars and things like that. Okay, it is gonna have local minimum. It's almost exactly that problem I drew on the board actually except the cars are moving, okay, and you don't have a model for them. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, but it's really used in practice. Um, Scott Kindersma uh, gave a talk about how they do trajectory optimization for Atlas, you know, doing parkour and everything like that. Uh, you, you can watch. They're, they are doing extremely good trajectory optimization and model predictive control, and that is the heart of what makes Atlas do parkour. If you ask them, what, what makes it work? This, I mean, he publicly says this is what makes it work. Really, really good optimization codes. Okay, highly optimized, running on the fly, doing trajectory optimization. People have done cool projects. Uh, that's another thing I'll talk about at the end is it's project time. This is someone did trajectory optimization for dynamic soaring a couple of years ago, okay, and using beautiful trajectory optimization to make, um, you know, dynamic soaring airplanes. But let me tell you my version of this story, which is kind of fun, I guess. All right, so uh, one of the things, one of the first projects that we really um, benefited from the power of trajectory optimization from, we started 
um, let's see, I started as working on walking robots, right? And I, as a faculty candidate, I came and gave my job talk at MIT, for instance, and I uh, was talking about walking robots. But one of the great things about being a faculty candidate is you meet like all the interesting people, and they all pay attention to you just for one day, and then they, you know. But but you have like everybody's complete attention. And they have great conversations, and and someone said to me, <clears throat> "Why walking robots? Why not flying like a bird?" And I was like, "I don't know. That's what I should do next." And so um, that wasn't a thing back then. You might have seen ornithopters now, but there was a, like a small hobby community of trying to make these robotic birds, and we started trying to build really big ones that could carry a computer. Computers were bigger back then. So this is actually a two meter wingspan bird. It's still, uh, it's hanging up in my lab. Uh, it's actually pretty fun because <clears throat> it started off, it had a breakaway beak, but it just broke away so many times that we just flew it headless uh, for the rest of time. Okay, but this is a big two meter wingspan ornithopter. And I was trying to work on, uh, trying to understand what could birds do that planes couldn't do. Right? A lot of people thought about flapping for efficiency or something like that, but that's a hard argument. Propellers are like really, efficient. I mean, if maybe when you get to the really small scales um, for the Harvard folks, you know, I think that does make sense. But, I, you know, because of friction in the propeller, more than aerodynamics. <clears throat> but uh, at, at a large scale, I don't think birds are good in terms of efficiency until you get to soaring and stuff. Okay, so we said that they're maneuverable. These are, these are, it's almost like the difference between interacting with the air, um, you know, with a fully dexterous hand versus, a, you know, having mittens on. So we started thinking, like, what kind of dexterous things could we do with robotic birds? Like, well, birds are really good at landing on a perch, right? Let's see if we could make a, our robotic bird land on a perch. We did eventually, you'll see. But, but actually, we're like, well, actually, could an airplane land on a perch? Is it really that hard for an airplane to land on a perch? So we actually backed up and just wanted to, just so we could set the stage for the, perch, for the flapping, we started working on, um, you know, understanding the perching problem. So what is the perching problem in its essence, okay? Um, when birds land on a perch, you should be very impressed, okay? Because this guy is coming in, at, you know, to, to land at an insane angle of attack, okay? You can sort of see it in the smoke trails, but his wings are fully stalled, right? Which is sort of supposed to be the scary regime, right? You don't want to stall your airfoils. Right? The, the, the st airfoil stall means, that, you know, if you're at a low angle of attack, your air is staying nice and attached. Your control surfaces have control authority, right? If you go up to too high of an angle, then the air basically can't bend around your wing fast enough. You get separated airflow. And that's a bummer because your control surfaces tend to be at the back of your wing, right? And so if you're having like turbulent air on your control surfaces, then you've lost a lot of control authority. But birds seem to do that all the time, right? And there's always, that's, this is maybe what separated flow can look like, but even that's a fairly structured flow. Okay, so we said, could we take an airplane, a very simple, in fact, how simple could we make it, a very simple airplane and try to make it land on a perch like a bird, right? So the first thing we did is like how, what, what, let's just compare birds and planes, okay? And actually the person who did this was um, uh, heavily involved in this was Woody Hoberg, who I'll, I'll tell you about again in a, second, in a minute, but remember the name Woody Hoberg. Okay, so um, we tried to compare, a fair comparison, you know, the right way to do these comparisons is to do a dimensionless analysis or a dimensional analysis, right? So you have to scale out the effects of size, right? Um, so we say a bird or a plane with mass M with wing area S in some fluid density going from some distance to some distance. The right way to sort of say how good of a percher are you independent of size is something like a distanced average drag coefficient. How, how it's the proportional way rate at which you're able to stop. You should be impressed if somebody has, if a 747 has a good, you know, distance to average drag coefficient, that's impressive. If a bird has one, that's impressive. And it's sort of more fair to compare birds versus planes in these dimensionless numbers. So a few reference points, okay? So 747 landing at like Logan gets a 0.16. That's, that's like the, the distance to average drag coefficient we calculated. There's been super short runway landings that have been done by thrust vectoring, which are incredibly good, they get like up to 0.3, right? And they can stop on like a, a carrier or, some, or things like this, okay? There was a project at, the, at Cornell that was working on perching planes where they were, it was really clever. They're actually, they're doing morphing wings, okay? Where they would actually tilt their fuselage up 
the body up and get the drag on the body, but leave your wings in attached flow so you had control authority there. And so you get a lot more drag, but not as much as if you go like this, right? And then they also moved their tail down to get out of the wake so that they had control authority on the tail. And that gets you like 0.25, it's pretty good. And then we went to our biologist friends. And I actually, it's funny, I, I, Andy B. Winter at Harvard, he's just a fantastic collaborator, fantastic guy. I was like, okay, give me like the best bird you got. Like I want a goshawk or like a, something. That he's like, eh, pigeons are actually way better. So he says like they, they come in and they like steal your lunch in the city. They're really maneuverable, right? So I was a little bummed to not have like a goshawk, but he, we figured out what the numbers were for a common pigeon, okay? A 10, okay? So like the, I should have put it in actually. I have a picture of, of when Will I Am randomly came to visit the lab and we were telling him about this and he's like, pigeons are ghetto birds, they've got mad stuff. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, that's, that's a keeper. Yeah, so, um, but really, like this, like if the 747 were gonna land on a perch like this, I mean, its wings would pop off. That's, that's where it's not fair is the structural analysis has another set of dimensional numbers. So a 747 couldn't do that, but it would have to stop in like 30 meters or something like that, right, to be, to be as good as a pigeon. Okay, so, um, so we started trying to see how, how well we could do with our flat wing airplane. We built a simple glider. This was like the first days of mocap. Okay, we had a, our first, one of our first motion capture systems ever. We were super excited about it. We tried to do just flat plane plate wings because we're gonna be stalled most of the time. Optimized airfoil isn't gonna do me much good. Put a little dihedral in for the aero folks, you know, so we wanted it to be passively stable in, in roll, you know, so we, if you put your wings up just a little bit, then you tend to, to right yourself, okay? And then the control was off board. We just did, used a radio, a standard um, radio, but there was only one actuator on the tail in the elevator. It's a little, foam plane, it's important that it's foam because we broke a lot of planes and we had to be able to rebuild them quickly, okay? And then we actually, um, yeah, we built this huge catapult. It was actually intimidating. Like you, you would just fire this because we didn't have a big room. So we, there's not even a propeller on this. We just like would fire it out of a cannon basically into this small motion capture arena and then try to land on the perch, okay? So we started off, we did a bunch of system identification, we tried to experimentally capture the lift and drag coefficient. For those of you that have studied aerodynamics, the, these are, this is a very nonlinear regime. Nor, normally you'd see a lift or drag coefficient that goes up to like stall, which flat plate stall close to zero actually. Um, so that's a stall right, probably right there, okay? It's sort of weird to see an angle of attack plot that goes all the way up to 140 degrees. That's upside down, and, you know, um, right? But we were doing this uh, in, experimentally. We're in a di very dynamic uh, vortex shedding kind of regime. All right, but we got beautiful curves, and we actually didn't get this in a wind tunnel. We got this by firing it off into the motion capture, differentiating twice, and, and taking our data out. And then we saw this on the drag coefficient. The, the, the red is flat plate theory, okay? The drag coefficient, we're like, oh, that's messy. Our, our accelerometers must not be good. But it turns out that's not messy. It's beautiful. That's the vortex shedding. You can actually plot that over time, and you see the beautiful, you can actually watch the vortices poof, 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 off the back of the wing. Okay, and it looked like this. We, this is how we, we actually built, some of you in, have known in lab, we built some wind tunnels, um, you know, with, in, in various places around campus until they kicked us out, and then somewhere else around campus until they kicked us out. We built these little wind tunnels in order to take these pictures, understand the, the vortex shedding off the back of a wing. And yeah, you did this by putting titanium tetrachloride, which is this terrible chemical, on the leading edge, but it, it makes this beautiful white smoke. And then you fire it off your catapult, you like remove anything metal from the, the workspace because it will corrode instantly when it gets in touch with titanium tetrachloride. You try not to breathe, um, and you take beautiful pictures. Right? This is also with a laser, by the way. So there's a, I had to borrow a laser. Someone's like, yes, uh, don't shoot your eye out, kid. It was like a pretty powerful laser, okay, and you, you collimate it into a line, so you light up just a line of the smoke and take these pictures. And uh, yeah, this is one of the places where we hit out and made our, our wind tunnel, okay, uh, with like fans from like someone's dorm room or something, uh, okay, and a lot of drinking straws that blow straighteners. Okay, so now we get to underactuated, right? So we, we made a simple, I actually thought this project was gonna be about learning. 
We started it saying aerodynamics are hard. We're not going to be able to do good models. This is going to be the reinforcement learning project in the, in the lab. But it turns out the simple models worked really well. Okay? Um, so we made this planar dynamic model. The aerodynamics we fit from data, but they were mostly the flat plate curves with just a little bit of delta. Um, our state space was the x, y, theta of the plane, and then um, x dot, y dot, theta dot. And then the propeller, uh, so the uh, elevator is uh, velocity controlled. So that's why we had an odd number of, of velocities, or of, of states, because we, we commanded the velocity. Our, our control input was phi dot, and so we had a seven dimensional state space, which was just a bit too big for value iteration. I would have loved to do value iteration, but it wasn't happening. Okay, long story short, firing it off, good control with trajectory optimization, and you'll see in a second, and some feedback control. This is a high speed video slowed down. We had a string across the lab, and we could reliably fire this thing, go through a, a post stall maneuver, and land on a string. Yeah? The entire trajectory was typically about 0.8 seconds. We would launch it from six to seven and a half meters per second or something like that and most of the time we would land on the perch. Okay. Oh man, this is the most of the time video. Ah, bummer. Ah, oh, poor Joe. There's a video of Joe throwing the plane. He's, he's like, you know, and it would always land on the perch, okay? And he worked really, that was like his whole thesis. So, um, if you're out there, Joe, I apologize. Internet's not good here. Okay, so um, how did we do? We got about a 1.1. Um, and afterwards, we found out that MIGs were doing about a 0.9 up in the air. That's a diff pretty different uh, business than landing on a perch, but up in, up in the air doing these kind of stunt show maneuvers, they were getting about a 0.9. So we got about a 1.1. And at some point, you, need, you actually need to do more in order to slow down faster, right? Uh, those pigeons are they've got a mad stop. Okay, the, the, the workflow on this was basically trajectory optimization plus trajectory stabilization, which we'll tell you about, plus sums of squares to compute Lyapunov functions around the trajectories. Okay, so this is like a little preview of what we'll talk about in the next thing, but these trajectory optimization codes are gonna go far, right? And maybe this, at the time, the solution for thinking about not all of the state space, but some tube of state space was trajectory optimization codes for perching, okay? Compute local, even LQR feedback works very well. And then you compute the region of attraction roughly, but it's a time varying region, we'll talk, we'll talk about it, as a time varying Lyapunov function which turned out to be a certificate saying, I know if I start inside this funnel, then I, can stay, I will stay inside this funnel according to my model and some worst case disturbance models, okay? So, I would, so basically what we ended up doing was making a library of these controllers. We'd fire it off if we were inside a funnel. We said, I can, I can use that trajectory and that feedback, land on the perch, and got to the point where Joe could you know, throw it and get to the perch, okay? This is trajectory optimization for a flapping version which still works. Nonlinear, direct transcription, or direct collocation, which I'll tell you more about, but still works. This one looks, I think, to my eyes, that looks like a, I don't know, a dragon attacking a castle or something, right? Okay, but I think you need flapping to do a little bit better. Let me see if I get that in here. Here's the flapper. That one occasionally landed on the perch. <laughs> I would say that one was never as robust as the, as the you know, throw it from all initial conditions, but mostly because those guys were, were done with their thesis and moved on. Uh, okay, so that's kind of a preview of where, where the trajectory optimization stuff can take you. Um, that just to come back, Woody is in space. He just like, Woody just launched into space on Crew 6 the other day. It's totally, Bizarre coincidence, but the guy who was working on the perching planes, um, you know, just launched on Crew Six, and he's uh, he's up there. Yeah, that's him there. And 
we, he said uh, he would be willing to take a memento from the lab up into space. And so we printed out a little carbon perching plane and he's gonna bring it back and we're gonna be able to say, hey, this was in space. <laughs> Thanks to Woody. All right, good. So we'll get more into the details of trajectory optimization last time, but it's a fun thing. Oh, let me just say quickly, the projects are, it's project time, this is what I was gonna say first. Uh, so along with the problem set that's just being released uh, is a project proposal in the next week. There's two phases of the project proposal, right? Uh, please take time to think about it in time for the first project proposal, but it's, that's designed as a mechanism for us to give you feedback. And then if your project proposal is great, we'll just say, you're done, great, just resubmit, maybe to keep the bookkeeping easier. Um, but, if, but if you want a lot of feedback, ask us now, but you'll also be able to ask us through the project proposal process. Um, so next Wednesday you'll have that. And at the bottom of the website there, uh, which is not working, but at the bottom of the website you'll see some project ideas that we've put up. I've even put a few more up this morning. So um, feel free to take a look there and just look through the, the different guidelines. Okay, see you soon.